Okay, I gotta be honest with you, I'm a little bit confused by the premise of this one. Mostly because this is a blank sheet of paper. Very confusing. Tells me nothing. Now, as for the thumbnail of this video, also confusing. Straw Hat Evolution. The hell does that even mean? I'm the one that made that thumbnail and I don't even know what that means. Evolution? What, like Pokemon? Are the Straw Hats Digimon now? I mean, it's okay if they are. I'll talk about whatever, okay? Actually, Frankie does fit that description. Actually, okay, wait a second. Hold on. Frankie starts at Battle Frankie 36. Right? Okay, that's his, like, his initial form. And then he digivolves into champion, Battle Frankie 37, armored me! And then he evolves into ultimate, Battle Frankie 38, the Frankie Shogun! And Mega could go even beyond that, because Frankie, you know, could build a bigger and better Megazord, okay? So, that works. Also, Chopper! Chopper has, like, now he has his baby Gramps form. So, Chopper has, like, a baby form, and then, which is, like, his rookie form, and then champion Chopper, and then ultimate is his heavy point, and then BOOM! MEGA MONSTER POINT CHOPPER! Alright, alright, we can work with this! Straw Hat Evolution! Don't know what the others would be- No, Luffy's Gears? Okay, this works! We could make a whole video! But that's not what the premise is, no. Um, we're talking about the character development of the Straw Hats. That was just way too many letters for the thumbnail. I, I thought it looked kind of clunky. So, uh, we went with Evolution instead. Thank you, Thesaurus.com! So anyway, yes, uh, we've made videos before talking about how the Straw Hats are going to, like, get stronger by the end of Wano, what abilities they might possess, you know, like, uh, Zoro unlocking Conqueror's Hockey or something. I don't know where I would have got the idea for that. Oh, by the way, I have to address that really quick, okay? I've done so many collaborations in the past week, and there was, like, it was a really busy week, okay? So I didn't really get a chance to address this. I wanted to talk about this in the stream on Saturday, but I missed it, okay? So, remember not the last episode of One Piece, but the one before that, where Zoro uses Conqueror's Hockey, and, uh, I completely missed <laughs> the scene where he actually knocks people out. That was... I literally watched that episode twice, and I somehow missed that scene both times. I was just looking away, or checking my phone, and I'm just like, okay, and I look up, and I'm like, oh, that's the end of the episode. Oh my god, but yeah, there was a scene in the episode where Zoro, like, glares at one of the Beast Pirates members, and everybody was talking about, Zoro's Conqueror's Hockey in the anime! And I'm just like, oh, okay. So I saw that scene with, the, like, Zoro glaring at the random dude, and I'm like, oh, that must be what everybody's talking about and then i put out the video and then at the end of the vi at the end of the video at all the comments are just like teching did you not seriously see the scene where he actually used conqueror's hockey to straight up knock like five or six beast pirates out around him i'm like um uh, no i didn't see that so uh i apologize i just missed that by happen chance but yeah the anime was uh that's not so much foreshadowing that's just straight up revealing you know it would, be, it would be like in the next episode if yamato just reveals the devil fruit you know like oh this is my form like the makami form here it is you know that that would be kind of similar because that was straight up but i just wanted to mention that because i missed it okay so uh yeah we've talked about that though we've talked about like the straw hats getting hockey like robin awakening uh, armament hockey during the fight with Black Maria, perhaps, and so she'll have that moving on. Chopper's got his new Rumble Ball, and maybe some other forms he can work with, you know, he can work with the chemistry and everything like that. But instead of talking about abilities, let's talk about actual character development that the Straw Hats have uh, received throughout this uh, course of this arc of Wano, more specifically Onigashima, because I've been looking back at the fights, and... There's some really, really good moments here with each of the Straw Hats all, you know, uh, either reaffirming their dreams or why they're there or why they're fighting for the Straw Hats, you know, what Luffy means to them, what the rest of the Straw Hats mean to them. We got a really good one with Robin in the last chapter. Also, Brooke a little bit. We had some bonding between Robin and Brooke and their backstories. Uh, there was a really good scene with Nami when, you know, Ulti was about to kill her, you know, like with like Nami all bloodied and crying and she knows like this is the end. She could die right there, but she still reaffirms, you know, I'm here because Luffy will be the Pirate King, and I'm not gonna lie about that, even in the face of death, okay? Now, not all of the Straw Hats have had moments like that yet, but a lot of them, I think their fights are still going on, like, I don't think Frankie and Sasuke, I don't think that's over yet, uh, Jinbei's just recently, you know, he's joined the crew, and he had some moments with Who's Who, so we're just gonna be talking about that today. Um, I could just go in order, like I normally do, you know, Luffy to Jinbei, but I feel like, you know, that's, I've done that so many times, so let's do this a different way. The D&D &D way. I need a D10 because there's actually 10 straw hats now. D10, D10. Oh, let's use my gummy dice. 
gummy dice. They're like little little red dice that are like gummy. Okay, so let's roll this dice and, uh, you know, one will be Luffy. Here's a reference table for you. Reference table! Reference picture of all the Straw Hats numbers that correspond to them. And so I'll roll this dice and we'll talk about them in order to re-roll any doubles. Okay, let's go. Who's the first Straw Hat we're talking about? Zero. That's ten. Starting off with Jinbei. And that's great because Jinbei just joined. So he hasn't had quite as much time to build up the relationship with the others, but due to the Fishman Island arc and the actions of Luffy defeating the new Fishman Pirates and Horty and everybody like that. And of course, you got to remember the underlying tones of that arc uh, that was exemplified perfectly by Fukuboshi. When Fukuboshi was like, he was defeated, he was bleeding, he was crying, and he was yelling to Luffy as the Noah was about to crash down. Fukuboshi was just like, listen, Straw Hat, you don't have to save the island completely. You don't have to change the world. Just just set it back to zero. Just let, let's try to get at least a clean slate. Let's at at least try to get back up to that point and then we can work on it from there okay can you at least reset it to zero and luffy and the rest of the straw hats uh successfully did that they saved fishman island and that arc ended of course with jinbei offering his blood to luffy fishmen and humans exchanging blood something that was considered uh against the law in fishman island for many years many centuries due to the way that humans have treated fishmen and merfolk over the years smashed into smithereens right there with luffy saving the island and Jinbei, the first son of the sea, you know, a very highly revered person at Fishman Island, giving his blood to Luffy. Jinbei is extraordinarily happy to be part of the Straw Hat crew. And of course, his dream is very much what Otohime and Fisher Tiger's dreams were, like parts of, of each of their dreams, where, you know, he wants Fishman to live on the surface amidst the sun. That is their ultimate dream. The sun pirates living on the surface, equal to all the humans, equal to everybody else, bathed in the actual sun and not shoved at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, that's very much Jinbei's dream. And he loves the Straw Hats for everything that they did but also I think he genuinely is having fun for like one of the first times in his life you get that impression with Jinbei um, because he was very much like on a direct mission when he was part of the Sun Pirates under Fisher Tiger and everything like that they had camaraderie or anything but then after the death of Fisher Tiger you know Jinbei Jinbei was not always like you know okay with humans he wasn't always just like all right yeah he wasn't as bad as Arlong was where Arlong took it to a serious degree where he went to Kokoyashi and enslaved the humans, just like how, you know, the fishmen were enslaved by the Celestial Dragons and everything. Jinbei wasn't that far, but he had a moment there where he's just like, I don't know if I can forgive them for everything that they've done, right? But now that he's seen the Straw Hats and he's seen the good in humanity, he's traveling with them and having genuine, uh, like, fun. He's having good times with them and he thinks that, like, yes, if I travel with them to the end of the seas, I will have a great adventure as well, of course, but I will also be able to realize Otohime and Fisher Tiger's dreams along the way. I think, um, um, Jinbei sees a lot of that in Luffy and in the Straw Hats, like, this this could happen if I travel with them. And so it's been so long, of course, for Jinbei to finally properly join the crew, uh, because, you know, he had to, you know, go back to Big Mom and, you know, resign from her service, and then the whole Totland arc happened, and then, of course, he couldn't join right at the end of Totland, he had to fight with his brethren. Uh, but now he's finally there, he's fighting alongside them, he defeated Who's Who, uh, we get a little bit of um, introspective into the way that fishmen were treated for hundreds of years with Who's Who's comments to Jinbei, and then Jinbei punches him in the face with DEMON BREAKFAST! BOOM! It's like breakfast, except with bricks. Don't eat bricks for breakfast, by the way. That's not a very healthy part of a balanced diet. Um, but yeah, so I don't think the fight with Jinbei and Who's Who is over yet. I think Who's Who is going to recover. He'll get back up, his mask will crack, and we might get some more scenes there. But just everything we've seen up until now with Jinbei, um, I look forward to the final saga of this story with Jinbei being part of the crew proper. And I hope we get some more moments with the crew just hanging out at least now that Jinbei has joined. We don't get those all the time, but typically we get a little bit of it after a crew member just joins to see how the dynamic is with everybody. So at least after the battle at Onigashima is over, we'll have a big banquet at Wano and Jinbei will be there, you know, and having fun with the Straw Hats and we'll get to see how that kind of works out and that'll be nice. Uh, but yeah, moving on to the final saga, if Jinbei truly is the final Straw Hat, you know, if Yamato decides to stay in Wano, if Carrot does not join, if it's just Jinbei for the rest of the series. Hey, I'm okay with that. We'll roll with it and uh, 
uh, see what happens there. Okay, so we get to see a little bit more with Gene Bay. All right, so that was Gene Bay rolling again. What do we got? We got number nine now. So we're just going in opposite order. That's great. Okay, number nine is of course Brooke, and this is great because Brooke just had the last chapter with Robin. Very good moment there. Um, I feel like I should highlight again, and I've mentioned it in the review, but I, I feel like I really should just highlight once more how purely tragic and sad and crushing both Brooke and Robin's backstories are. And they had a moment there where they're each aware of their backstories. I'm sure Robin, or at least some other crew members, maybe spoke a little bit of the past of Robin to Brooke when he joined, and the, all of the crew found out his backstory, you know, during Thriller Bark. Um, you know, there was even the scene when Robin and Brooke, after Brooke defeats Talaran, because Brooke was there as well. Uh, Robin was there, you know, when they defeated the giant spider zombie and everything like that. And of course, his dream to find Laboon and everything. But I think this is one of the first moments where, okay, here's Brooke and Robin in the middle of a serious fight with a Toby Ropo. And, you know, she has this very unique ability to create illusions. And so Robin sees the illusions of her mother, Olvia, and her teacher, Professor Clover, and her friend, Jaguar D. Saul. And then Brooke is in the background like, hey, Robin, you know, it's just illusions. Don't fall for it. And she doesn't. She, you know, sees them for about a few seconds. She cries. She has a single tear because it's just, just the idea. Like, she knows right away their illusions, but she gets a chance to see her mother again, and Clover, and Saul, and so it's like, it's like looking at a picture, you know? I don't even know if she has pictures of them, really. Olvia did have a wanted poster, so maybe Robin keeps that as, like, a keepsake. Maybe she found one somewhere, and she keeps it with her just to have a picture of her mom, uh, but she might not have any pictures of Clover or Saul at all, so just, it's like finding an old picture in the attic that you haven't seen in a while, and just like, oh, I remember this person. It's been so long. They're gone now, and so I think that's what, how Robin responded. You know, she saw her mom and Clover and Saul. It's like, it's so great to see you guys again, but I know you're just illusions, and then after that, she says to Brooke, like, oh, Brooke, you were immune to those illusions. You saw right through them. And it wasn't like Brooke because he was a skeleton or he could see soul powers or anything. It wasn't like, oh, I could see through the illusions, Robinson, and I saw that they were the souls of the smile users or anything like that. No, it's actually a lot more sad than that. It's just that living in the Florian Triangle for five decades afloat on a ghost ship that he could not steer stuck in the fog, he was so used to seeing the illusions and the mirages and the dreams and probably nightmares of all of his crewmates like I literally cannot properly convey what Brooke went through it's just too much all right but just to give you some ideas Brooke probably had nice dreams of his crew like his dreams like oh the, the crew is back there's Yorkie that's great I'm sure sometimes he had nightmares nightmares of like his skeleton zombie crew rising from their coffins on board the rumbar pirate ship and just like Brooke you left us it's like no I didn't I'm sorry you know it's like I'm sure he probably had that kind of stuff. He hallucinated all the time in the day. He probably hallucinated they were walking around on the deck. Sometimes he went over to the side of the ship and just stared out into the fog. He just staring out into the fog long enough. He probably started to see the images in the fog, like they were walking through the fog. Or maybe he saw a Laboon in the fog. Like, Laboon, you've come! You've come to save us! He probably hallucinated Crocus. Like, oh, Crocus and Laboon are here! They're finally here to save me from this place! And then they're just fade away into the mist. And that went on and on and on and on for decades, literally 50 years until the Straw Hats found him, okay? Uh, hell, I bet the Straw Hats, when Brooke first saw their ship arriving in the mist, I bet he probably thought, oh, a lion ship. Hmm. That's an interesting illusion today. All right, let's see what it's all about. You know, at, at some point he just stopped caring. You know, it's just like, oh, another hallucination of Captain Yorkie. That'll be the about 2,000th one of those I've had. All right, well, how you doing? You know, and just like, he's just so aware at this point. So it's very, very tragic. But I like that idea, that little moment of bonding and character development we had between Brooke and Robin. Now, at the end of that chapter, Brooke also went, he's not going to fight against Black Maria. That's going to be a one-on-one -on -one fight kind of between Robin and her because Robin's sort of like, okay, I got this. You know, after what she was saying about Sanji and everything, Robin's like, I can take care of this. And so Brooke went to go take care of uh, Black Maria his little click of like smile users and everything but still, Brooke might help in the fight. Maybe Brooke can defeat the Smile users and then go back to maybe help out Robin. Like, maybe uh, Robin fights Black Maria and she's winning, and then right at, at, at that moment, maybe Black Maria does something underhanded, and then, oh no, Robin's going to be defeated, but then Brooke shows up and like, I've defeated your minions, and now I shall help you, uh, Robin. And then maybe Brooke, like, freezes Black Maria's, like, spider legs to the floor or something, then Robin delivers the finishing blow. Like, that would be a cool moment, right, just to see Brooke and Robin maybe finishing her off. But if it was just Robin as 
as well. I mean, I'm 100% cool with that because Robin's amazing. Uh, but yeah, I love that character development moment. I don't know if we're going to get another moment with Brooke throughout this arc. Uh, one of the big things that people always bring up is, of course, Brooke is um, obviously the oldest member of the Straw Hats. He's 90 years old. And so he's from an era of history. Granted, he spent 50 of those years on a ship, kind of really not taking in any new information. But when he was alive and he was like a member of that uh, battle convoy of that kingdom in the West Blue, and then he joined the Rumbar Pirates, that would have probably been right around the time when, uh, well, we know Roger was a rookie because Brooke said that, but that was also right around the time that uh, Rox's crew was probably out in the world making big waves. And so nobody's really ever mentioned the Rox Pirates to Brooke. He has no real reason to bring it up because it happened so long ago from his perspective, and Brooke would have no idea what happened at God Valley or anything, but 50 plus years ago, that's probably right around the time Rox might have just, just started out being the big name in the world, right? We know Roger was a rookie, but he kind of remembered him, so he definitely remembers Rox if he can vaguely remember Roger, right? You know, like, maybe uh, maybe it could go something like this. Maybe Luffy will fight Kaido, obviously, and then Kaido will maybe mention Rox to Luffy, and that'll be the first time Luffy ever heard that word. You know, Kaido's like, I've never, I've never fought against someone as impressive as you, Straw Hat Luffy, since that time Rox defeated me. And Luffy's like, what are you talking about, Rox? You were defeated by Rox? <laughs> like, physical, like, you just ate Rox or something? And Kaido's just like... Ugh. and then he falls, and then maybe later at the banquet, Luffy's like, oh yeah, Kaido, when I defeated him, he said something about rocks, it was really weird, I didn't really get it, and then Luffy's eating, and then all the Straw Hats don't really understand it either, maybe Robin might, uh, she might know, you know, the history of rocks or whatever, but then Brooke might be like, you know, drop his food, like, oh, wait, he mentioned rocks? Luffy's like, yeah, something about rocks, I don't know what that even means, he's like, oh no, Luffy, Rox was a crew back when I was, you know, like, okay, so that might be a cool moment with Brooke, too. We might still have that, because the Straw Hats don't really know of Rox's existence, and Rox, the name, keeps getting name-dropped in One Piece, so that has to be relevant at some point. All right, so, that was Brooke. Moving on next, we have, it's just going to be number eight. No, it's nine again. Okay, re-roll. Probably going to have to do a lot of re-rolls. That's ten again. All right. Six. Okay, so six is Chopper, right? Yes, yeah, six is Chopper. All right. So Chopper, of course, I think already had his moment at Onigashima, and of course that moment was curing the ice Oni virus that Queen released on the entire live stage, okay? So Chopper had the really funny moment where, you know, he was turning into an ice Oni, and then he's like, okay, I gotta go cure everybody, and then Queen is like, oh, that Tanuki dog, he abandoned you all, he was a pirate, of course, he doesn't care about any of you, just like I don't care about any of you. And then Chopper shows up at the last minute, and he's all smooth and shiny, like he's been cured, and he's like, I'm here, it's fine, and then he fires the the phase nebulizer or whatever it was, it was called, you know, the, the Doofenshmirtz phase nebulizer. <laughs> and then he cures everybody, okay? And not only does he cure everybody, he also immediately pops the rumble ball, goes into his new monster point, and fights against Queen. Uh, because, of course, Queen's actions are completely antithetical to, to Chopper's position. And uh, I was thinking for a moment there, maybe is Chopper actually going to defeat Queen? Is Chopper with his new upgraded monster point going to be enough to defeat Queen? And we saw some really cool wrestling matches between them, but it was very clear that even with the extended monster point, it doesn't make the monster point any stronger, it just increases the time frame, and it also has the detriment of baby Gramps Chopper at the end of it. So even though we got to see, you know, him doing some body slams and suplexes, like picking up Brachiosaur Queen and slamming him into the ground, it's doing next to no damage on Queen whatsoever, and Queen was just realizing, like, hey, I'm just going to wait until you tire yourself out, because he could notice, you know, Chopper's getting more and more winded in this monster form. So he's like, I'm just going to wait until you get, you know, you run out of gas, and then I'll defeat you. And then Sanji showed up to save Chopper. So I don't know, I don't know. Chopper already had his big moment, where he saved everybody in the festival hall, you know, enemy and friend alike. You know, he saved the rest of the members of the Beast Pirates, the Waiters and the Pleasures, and they helped out the Straw Hats. So I don't think Chopper did that, though, because he wanted them to work on his side like oh if i save the beast pirates then they'll change sides chopper just did it because that's his hippocratic oath that's his doctor's oath you know i will help anybody that is sick and then here's somebody named queen that is you know creating viruses specifically targeting you know his own crew that's messed up it's messed up to release that kind of stuff on an enemy but on you know your allies is ridiculous so chopper of course healed everybody and then you know it's like okay i'm gonna defeat you queen for what you did now chopper right now i think is just going around making sure everybody is healed as best as possible helping Miyagi and Tristan out delivering the medicine to Zoro um, and I don't know how long this form is going to be where Chopper's in the baby Gramps form okay uh, since it might be 30 minutes in the monster point it might be a one-to-one -one. it might be 30 minutes in this form until he can regain his um, his regular appearance
balance in his form. And I don't think Chopper can shift forms with his Rumble Ball or his regular zone powers while he's in that state, okay? Think of it very similar to uh, Chibi Luffy. Whenever Luffy pre-time skip went into gear third, if he spent like 20 seconds in gear third, it seemed like he had to spend 20 seconds as Chibi Luffy until he regained his size. So that might be the kind of same thing that Oda's doing here with Chopper's like a new Rumble Ball, all right? Um, but I don't know. I don't know. If Chopper regains his original form and he can fight again, I don't know if there's a time limit like, okay, I just used a Rumble Ball for 30 minutes and then I had to recover for 30 minutes. Can Chopper just take another Rumble Ball or is there some other detriment? Like the more he takes, the longer the, um, the Baby Gramps form lasts or whatever, or there's another form that's even worse. You know, uh, he shrinks down even smaller, like the size of a pea if he uses it again. I do not know. Um, but right now, I think Chopper had some really good moments that really expressed his character and what he's all about so far in the story. Okay, so that was a really good moment there. Rolling the dice now, we have number three, which is, of course, Nami. Absolutely. So Nami, as I said, had the big moment when she was fighting against Ulti the first time, right? So Usopp was defeated at this point. He was on the ground bleeding, and then Ulti pretty much had Nami dead to rights. Picked up Nami and just like, I'm just going to headbutt you and just like, you know, crush your skull into a million pieces. Unless, Ulti, because of her personality, Ulti's like, tell you what, if you could admit that your captain is not going to be king of the pirates because, you know, you guys have been running around saying that the entire time. He's been saying that, you know, Kaido-sama is going to be the greatest pirate. He's going to be the pirate king. He's going to find the One Piece. I want you to admit that your captain isn't going to be Pirate King and I might let you go. And I don't even know if Ulti would have. Ulti might have just, even if Nami did cave and say, okay, fine, he's not going to be King of the Pirates. He's like, yeah, I know. BAM! And then just slams into Nami's head and just, you know, maybe Ulti would have done that as well, right? I don't think Ulti would have just left Nami off there, but that's not what happened. Nami, she was bleeding, she was hurting, and she was crying because I'm pretty damn certain Nami knew she was going to die there because they kind of busted out every trick on Ulti. You know, her climb attack at that point was useless. She didn't have Zeus at that point. Zeus went back to Big Mom. And so at that point, Nami was like, all right, I've tried everything against her. She's an ancient zone. There's no way I can beat her. Chop, I mean, not Chopper. Usopp is down on the ground. He's bleeding out. And Usopp's kind of like unconscious, sort of fading in and out. But Usopp's like, Nami, just, just say it. Just lie. It's okay to lie every now and then if it's going to spare your life. Life, okay, it's like your best shot and so Nami starts bawling her eyes out and like her nose is running and everything But she's like Luffy Luffy and Ulti's like yeah Luffy what? He's gonna be the Pirate King! And she's crying because she knows that is probably going to be the last thing she says She's still afraid to die But she is not so afraid that she's going to sell out her captain even though there's like nobody else around. It's not like she's admitting this to the entire hall or anything like that, or she's announcing it to the world. It's just Ulti, Usopp, and Page One that are there, right? So just two enemies and then Usopp, and even Usopp is like, it's okay to lie every once in a while, Nami, it's fine. You know, she just doesn't have it in her because of all the stuff that harkened back to when Luffy saved her at Kokoyashi during the Arlong Park arc, when Nami was at her absolute lowest point where she literally was stabbing herself in the arm on Arlong's tattoo that he made her get and so she's just stabbing the tattoo like Arlong Arlong you know I hate you so much and she's at a point where she's about to probably just die right there but then Luffy took his hat laid it down on Nami's head didn't really say a word other than just hey let's go and so he turned around in the straw hats written actions speak louder than words at this point so kind of flipped here where words speak louder than actions I guess with Nami in this case but this is what she could do right and so I guess at that point she realized you know I, I, I'm not going to die you know I, I'm not if I am going to die I'm not going to sell out my, my captain so maybe Nami thought, like, maybe she did realize, like, no matter what I say, I'm still going to die. But even that hope that was dangled in front of her, like, all I have to do is tell a lie to some enemy that doesn't even really matter, and then I get to walk away and maybe defeat her later, even with that being the option. And Nami is very clever, too. The, the uh, correct response there might have been, like, okay, if I lie to Ulti and say, oh yeah, Luffy's not going to be the Pirate King, she might let me go and then turn her back from me, and then I might be able to launch a sneak attack. That might have been an option, but Nami's like, I can't even do that. I can't. It's not in me. All right. I'm with Luffy on this journey. He helped me out so I can at least do the same for him. 
All right, so that was a very, very awesome moment from Nami. And of course, she managed to survive. And now, of course, also her reunion with Zeus there, where she forgave Zeus for abandoning her and going back to Big Mom and welcoming him back. And now Zeus is part of the Climate Act. And so now they're they're an awesome team of, like, lightning and thunder that will defeat this world, right? So it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool moment with Nami. But yeah, that's the standout moment with Nami in that arc. This was the moment where I really started to think, like, wow, yeah, Robin had the moment last chapter in Brook. And then you also had the moment with Nami, and then you also had the moments with Jinbei and all the other Straw Hats and Chopper. Like, Oda really is, and he's he's dispersing it throughout the arc. They're not all clustered together. Okay, that's why not all of the Straw Hats have had these kind of moments yet, uh, but we are going to get moments from all of them. You know, I don't think Frankie really had his moment yet, but let's see if um, he's the next one we talk about. Next number is number 10. All right, talked about Jinbei already. Number 6, that's Chopper. I'm rethinking this. Maybe I should reroll more than one D10 at this point. Uh, number 7. We got number 7, so that's perfect segue. Let's talk about Robin now. All right. So, not just last chapter, which was a really good moment as well, uh, not just the scenes with uh, Ulvia and Clover and Saul, but after Black Maria started uh, talking about Sanji. It's like, I can't believe Black Leg Sanji, the man that has the second highest bounty on your crew, would act in such a pitiful manner to call you here. You know, Nico Robin, you're nothing but a burden for your crew, you know, because you're the most valuable member. You can read Poneglyphs. Every pirate, every Yonko is going to be after you. You're just a burden. And Robin, you know, last chapter just says, hey, listen, Listen, you're not going to understand why it means so much to me that Sanji asked for my help. Okay, and so that's last chapter. Now, flashing back a few chapters ago when Sanji really did ask for help, uh, and then Robin showed up and winked at him and everything, and she said that again. The first thing she said to Sanji was like, it means a lot that you asked for my help. And then she winked, and then Sanji was like, oh my god, Robin, Sean, that's so nice. And then, you know, Sanji goes away, and I think he slips and falls on some of Brooke's ice. So that was kind of, uh, that was awkward. But the thing that means so much to Robin here is that for most of her life, she was a burden to pretty much everybody and every group and every pirate crew she encountered. Okay, now, some of these pirate crews that Robin was part of in her, in her formative years were not good people, okay? They were just brutal pirates that were just like burn and kill and murder and all that kind of stuff, right? But she was still a burden to even those kind of pirates, right? And even though... I like to think, like, even though Robin knew, like, okay, these pirates are just a means to an end for me, like, Robin really didn't form bonds with any of them, uh, just the idea that no matter where she went, no matter who she lived with, whether it was somebody that was genuinely trying to sell her out, because that happened a lot of times, too, like, right after Robin escaped from O'Hara, she was only eight years old, so she was traveling around the West Blue trying to find some kind of safe haven, okay? And some places she went, she was sold out right away, because there were wanted posters of her all over the place, right? This was right after O'Hara. So sometimes as soon as Robin walked into a town, there were probably people like, ah, it's the devil's child, call the cipher poles. But then there's other places where she was actually welcomed into people's homes for a little while and had sort of a regular life and she could maybe put this behind her. Um, there was one family she worked for and then the family found out about the bounty and they decided to sell her out and they chased after her. Uh, one of the saddest ones was there was this kindly old woman and Robin lived with her for a little while doing the chores around the house. And this kindly old woman, you'd think she would be the one to like give Robin a safe haven. Even she. She was like this greedy old woman that sold her out to the world government. She's like, where's my payment? I told you where she was. That is so tragic. Because just think about that. Like Robin, as this little kid, is on the run from the government. And she's on this random island. And she's like, okay, I got to stay away from every town. So she's walking out in the woods. And she finds Grandma's cottage or whatever. And she's like maybe here and then she lives you know she's like stays outside and the grandma finds her like oh little dear what are you doing sleeping out in the rain come on in it's okay you can stay here as long as you like and then robin's like okay can i actually is this going to be like can i can i be safe here finally can i put it all behind me and no she can't because even the old lady sold her out okay so that happened to her all throughout her life where she was nothing but a burden. So Robin probably just got into her head like, I am a burden to everybody, you know? And so then you have the moment with her and the Straw Hats, and the Straw Hats, of course, do not see her as a burden to the point where Sanji... You know, Sanji does not yell for Robin because, like, Robin, I'm so weak, you have to come and save me! You know, it was... Black Maria wanted him to call Robin, and Sanji's like, hey, and we'll get to this when we get to Sanji, but it, and Sanji's like, you don't understand Nico, Robin. 
All right, I will yell for her, not because you told me to, but because I trust in her as a member of our crew, as our Nakama. She will come, and she will fight you, and she will win, because I have trust in her. Okay, that was the whole point. And that meant the world to Robin. Okay, and in the last chapter, Robin exemplifies this. She doesn't go into a great detail for Black Maria, because once again, Black Maria would not care, uh, nor would she even understand about the relationship and everything uh, that the Straw Hats have. But, you know, Nico Robin says... Sanji will be one of the two wings for the Pirate King. So Zoro and Sanji will be the wings that carry Luffy to greatness, okay? And so that's all she needs to know. And then Robin begins the fight with Black Maria properly. So that was that was a great moment from Robin. So that's the whole reason I'm kind of making this video right now. So yeah, there's that. Okay, moving on. Who's the next person we're talking about? Uh, seven, that's Robin again. You know, I'm going to get another D10 here. Uh, another D10. I'm going to get three. I'm going to roll three. And whichever number, you know, we haven't talked about yet... Eight? Okay, we haven't talked about eight yet, so that's Frankie! Oh, yeah! Now, Frankie has had not a moment yet. Like, not a big moment. Like, he's had some cool moments. He had a Megazord versus a flying helicopter Triceratops. That was definitely a moment, but not a true moment yet, where we had, like, a super serious moment with Frankie during Onigashima. Oh, by the way, I should also clarify that. I'm mostly talking about, if it wasn't clear already, I'm talking about moments during the battle at Onigashima. Not moments in all of Wano arc, okay? I maybe should have clarified that, okay? And I'll title it, like, you know, the Straw Hats, you know, character development at Onigashima or something like that. So, uh, so far, Frankie, he, you know, showed up. He ran a motorcycle over Big Mom's face. So, um, hey, Barry, does that count as character development? I think that counts as character development right there. <laughs> right over Big Mom's face. That's, that's Frankie. That's what he needs. But no, I was thinking about ways that this could go uh, beyond that, where Frankie does have really serious moments. Just look at the fight between him and Senor Pink. At the end of the fight, he's like, hey, you know, maybe if we met under different circumstances some other time, we can have a drink and we can talk about the woman named Lucian or Russian together, right? And of course, that's Senor Pink's wife and the story that Senor Pink just alluded to to Frankie didn't tell him the whole story. But Frankie is like, oh, you're a true hard-boiled man, Senor Pink. Maybe someday we can have a drink together, right? So that was a good moment with Frankie, so he can't have serious moments like that. So right now in the fight, Frankie has lost the Frankie Shogun. He had to eject from it. The whole thing got crumpled and destroyed. And then there's, uh, you know, Sasaki in the air. And so Frankie fired the radical beam through him. But I don't think the fight is over yet. So it would be very interesting if there was a moment where Sasaki heals and he gets back up. And maybe Sasaki might have some sort of line to Frankie like, you know, I have the power of an ancient zone. My healing factor is immense. In fact, maybe the Triceratops zone is like the best in terms of endurance. Because that's the whole thing. Like, Sasaki led the armored squad. So he's like, in terms of endurance and stamina and just raw defense, uh, I, I'm the best at that out of all of the Toby Ropo. He's like, high spec defense. He's like, you can't defeat me. You're just a machine. If I rip off your arms, you know, you won't be able to heal them. Either you're a robot, you're a machine, right? You know, that's why I'm going to beat you. And Frankie might have a moment where he gets really serious and he maybe takes some cola out of his refrigerator. He Frankie gets up, he's all broken, and he takes off his goggles, pulls out a cola, and he's just like... It's water, not cola, but... Ugh. The reason I'm going to beat you is not because I'm a cyborg. It's because I am a man. And Straw Hat Luffy trusts in me. And I'm his friend. And I might be a machine, but I could still form bonds with people. You know, machines can be fixed. Uh, I can always rebuild. And, you know, you rebuild this. <laughs> and then he, he just ends the speech and takes out a giant missile launcher. Blasts it into Sasaki's face or something like that. But no, that would be really cool. It would be a really nice... You know what I'm actually honestly thinking of? Okay, does anybody ever remember the original Teen Titans? The Teen Titans show on Cartoon Network. Okay, Cyborg. Alright, there were a lot of episodes speaking about Cyborg and his body and, you know, how he feels about being, you know, robotic and everything like that. There were some episodes that spoke to the advantages of him having a robotic body, and then there were other episodes that spoke to him having his humanity and how that's more important, okay? So I, I really like that with Teen Titans. They had episodes that kind of focused on both of that there. Like the one episode where um, Cyborg, you know, he, was, he had like a 100% max output, and he's like, I'm a machine. I can't push past my limits. You know, I'm at 100%. That's his 
strong as I can be. And then the Titans like push him like, no, you can do better. And so he pushes himself and he pushes past. He goes 110, 120%. Like that's the humanity in him that drives him. So I think that would be really, really cool. And uh, I'm assuming there's a lot more of that stuff with Cyborg in the comics, but I just know from the, the Teen Titans, the original show. But that'd be really cool. I was thinking about that with Frankie where maybe Sasaki's talking down to Frankie because he's a cyborg. And so, you know, you can't just beat me with some scrap metal and some toys. And then so Frankie's like, no, I'm a man. And so I'll push past my limits as a man and I'll defeat you, right? And so we might have something like that with Frankie. I'm looking forward to that. What are some other numbers I rolled? I rolled two eights and a two. So now we're going to talk about um, Zoro. All right. Zoro. Zoro has had a lot of moments. Zoro had some moments during Wano itself, because this is, you know, Wano country. This is samurai country, so it makes sense that Zoro would be kind of focused on here. Um, I don't think we've gotten the best of it, though, yet. We had the moment with him and Enma. We had the moment with uh, at the festival hall, where he sees the uh, the way that all the Beast Pirates are acting, and he attacks them, and he, he, he uh, berates Luffy for it. Like, Luffy, you gotta save your strength. You just can't attack everybody in the middle of the hall. And Luffy's like, yeah, but they were wasting food. He's like, oh, okay, they gotta die then. <laughs> you know, it's, oh, okay, well, that, that's, that changes things, right? So we already had moments like that. We had the moment with uh, Zoro facing down against Kaido and saying that, like, you know, this will be the final attack, you know, and he uses his Ashura to slice down Kaido there. Uh, it doesn't work, and he gets, you know, defeated, and he has to go be healed. But I don't think that's it. We're still going to have a really good moment with Zoro when he gets healed, and he goes to fight against King, most likely. Um, and maybe it might be a situation where King reveals his backstory to Zoro a little bit there. There. Um, Zoro has always has always been a little bit of a Ronin, a wandering samurai. Okay, he was a bounty hunter for a while before he met Luffy. Maybe King's story might be a little bit of a parallel to that. So there's a little bit of something that that they could go off of each other, right? And so King's like, you know, I am the last warrior of my race, and I've been wandering this world until I discovered Kaido. And Zoro was like, well, I was kind of traveling the world sort of listlessly, like literally listlessly, because Zoro has no sense of direction until he met Luffy. So maybe King and him might have some like, kind of like a you know bonding moment there like they're sort of the same and so Zoro could have a moment there where he reveals he's like yes but the difference is that you're following Kaido as like your master or your boss uh, Luffy is my boss but it's more of a mutual thing we're all family is what it really matters about and that man will become the pirate king and I will be his first mate and I will be the one that is the greatest swordsman that supports um, you know Luffy and everything like that and so you could have a really cool moment where you know, King definitely wants to support Kaido as well, but it might be out of, it, it might not be out of the fact that he views Kaido as family or anything like that. It might just be more out of pure gratitude uh, because Kaido might have been the one that welcomed, you know, King into his fold. And so maybe King might view it as like, there's a debt that I have to repay to Kaido, and that's why I'm here and that's why I'm doing all this stuff. Now, Zoro is indebted to Luffy as well, but the whole reason he's around is not because of some debt to Luffy. You know, he wants Luffy to be the Pirate King. He genuinely wants that. He genuinely sees Luffy as his friend, as all the Straw Hats as his family, okay? So it's not just like, you know, I'm indebted to Luffy, and that's the only reason I'm on this crew. That might be the reason King's on the Beast Pirates, not the reason Zoro's on the Straw Hats. So... Might be something like that. We could get some really cool moments with Zoro. Also with Enma. And as a final cap off to that, after the battle is over, I want to see a moment where Zoro returns to the Ringo region and he visits Ryuma's grave. And I do not know how Oda's going to do that. If we're going to see, like, a ghostly Jedi spirit of Ryuma appearing over the grave and maybe the spirit, like, speaks to Zoro. Like, it's okay. You've become a true samurai. You've lived up to the name of Shimosuke. And then Zoro's like, wait, I'm a Shimosuke. And then Ryuma's just like, bye. And he just fades away into the snow or into the fog or mist or whatever. Um, I don't know if Oda's going to go something like that with it. Or maybe Tengu Yama might visit Ryuma's grave with Zoro to lay the Shu Suite arrest at last properly. Onimaru might be there. Kawamatsu might come along. Hiori might come along. And then, well, Zoro's coming, definitely. Uh, but anyway, they're all there maybe visiting Ryuma's grave. And maybe Tengu Yama reveals, like, you know, Zoro, I never said it to you earlier because I didn't think it was, I wasn't certain and there was a battle coming and everything. But you do look like a Shimosuke. Like, Zoro looks like Ryuma. He looks like Ushimaru. He's like, you look like a member of the Shimosuke clan. So you are probably, and you are an amazing swordsman, and you've mastered the Enma, so that's all the proof I need. You are probably the distant descendant of Ryuma. And Zoro, like Luffy, doesn't really care about his lineage. I'm thinking Zoro probably wouldn't care too much about his lineage either. He would just be like, 
okay, I'm a member of the of the Shimosuke. I'm Ryuma's my great 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 grand uncle or whatever. It'd be further back than that because like 400 years ago. Um, but it would be interesting to finally connect the dots there. And Oda did say. Oda did say that it's something he wants to address, but not like a main plot thread. It's more of just like a side thing, okay? And he's already talked about Kozaboro and the SBSs and everything. Maybe Zoro will go on more detail of like, oh yeah, Kozaboro lived in my village. I met him and everything. So maybe it might be something like that. All right, but a lot more good Zoro moments coming down the pipeline with Wano. Rolling these dice now! We got a two, we got a two, we got a five. So that's Sanji. All right, so we got Sanji. So we've already discussed this with Robin a little bit, but to go into detail with it, and this is something a lot of people are really split on. Um, I don't think this is going to be the only moment because Sanji's fighting against Queen right now. Queen has connections to Judge. So obviously there's going to be some back and forth there where uh, Sanji might learn some more things about the Vinsmoke or Mads or Vegapunk or something like that. But the moment so far was the moment where Sanji was trapped by Black Maria because Black Maria basically knew the exact kind of guy Sanji was. And so she set up that whole scene with like a woman being disrobed and like, oh, Sanji will definitely fall for that. And he did. And so Sanji, he knows he's outclassed. Not outclassed in terms of strength or ability or anything like that or hockey, but he knows he's outclassed because he's very chivalrous and we know about that from Sanji's character you could say whatever you want but this has already been established um you know Sanji just he cannot fight against women that is just his character okay it's not something that he's like well I prefer not to but no it is something that was literally beat into him by Zeph for like 10 years all right so it's like his nature at this point okay and it's like you can argue that but even if I feel like even if Sanji could, like, grit his teeth and just fight through his nature and still fight against Black Maria, he wouldn't be able to go full power. There would always be something subconsciously holding him back. So I ask you, in that situation, when Sanji knows that, when he knows he can't fight against Black Maria, and even if he forced himself to try, he wouldn't be as strong, he would be still holding back, what does he do in that situation? Just let himself get hit and die? Or call for help? Call for help! from the people that you trust the most, the Straw Hat Pirates. And he trusts Robin, and he trusts all of his friends. And so he'll call for Robin to come and defeat uh, Black Maria, and so th that just shows Sanji's faith. And of course, Sanji is strong enough to fight against one of the All-Stars, and he's going up against Queen right now. So I've already discussed that earlier with Robin. I don't think I need to go into more detail with it right now, but I like that scene. At least it follows with uh, Sanji's character. I will bring it back. I will also compare it to the scene when Jinbei left um, Luffy at Totland when he decided to stay behind and fight against uh, Big Mom's crew with the Sun Pirates. A lot of people got mad at Jinbei at that point because it was like, oh my god, Jinbei, just go with the Straw Hats. All your crew, Aladdin, Wadatsume, everybody is just, go to the Straw Hats. Just join the crew already, right? Like, that was what everybody was really saying. It's like, why is Oda holding this off even more? And I think it's because Oda stopped and thought about it for a moment and like, would Jinbei, the, the first son of the sea, the knight of the sea, the character that I've created, would he go and do this? Would he, like, when his friends, when his son pirate crew is being attacked, because he was still the acting captain at that point, uh, are being attacked, would he just leave them behind to go travel with the Straw Hats, even if that's what they're telling him to do? And that's not what Jinbei would do. As a character, Jinbei was like, I need to stay with my, with my crew, my former crew, fight with them one last time, make sure they're okay. I gotta make sure they're okay. And then after they're away and safe and they're all healed up, then, then I will go and meet you again. I promise you that, Luffy. And he fulfilled that promise in spades. He showed up at Onigashima right before the battle started and everything. But just because it doesn't follow, like, the pacing too well, like, oh, that would have been a perfect place for Jinbei to join right there. It would have. It would have been a perfect place for Jinbei to join right there. They sail away from Totland together, going into the Wano country. That would have been fine. But I think it's important that Oda stuck to Jinbei's character. Just the same way he stuck to the character with Sanji. There you go. All right, so um, how many people do we have left here? I think it's just Luffy and Usopp, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, just Luffy and Usopp. So let's see, one or four? Uh, six, nine, and two, all right. Uh, one, there we go, we got two ones, two number ones, there we go, okay, so, now you feel like number one, shining bright for everyone, living out your fantasy, I don't remember the rest of the lyrics, yeah, this is a mallet, I use it to, uh, put pictures and whatnot up on the wall. Okay, so number one is Luffy, of course. Uh, that's Monkey D. Luffy, King of the Pirates. Um, 
the moment with Luffy that we're going to get, and we had the moment where he's like squaring up against Kaido and he's like, I got this one-on-one, -on -one. I'll take him down. Maybe a rain check for that. Um, there's the moment last chapter with Momo, like telling him, you know, Momo, you got to get us up to the mountain and everything like that. We are going to be building to a really epic moment. I think this is how it's going to go. I can't tell you exactly how it's going to go because, of course, I don't know that. But here's how it's going to roughly go. Luffy is going to be, you know, healed on the ground. You know, he's going to have the meat. Maybe Caribou's going to give him the meat or... Okay, that came out wrong. But you know what I mean? Like, it's like Caribou's like, Luffy, I have all this dripping meat. <laughs> you know, here you go. This swampy meat. Here you go. But no. Okay. So there's a scene where Luffy, he gets food. He's good. He's like, okay, I'm not back at 100%, but I can still go fight Kaido. Momo, you need to get me up there, okay? So Momo is going to head up there, back to the top. Luffy's going to fight Kaido for a third time, all right? And this time, he's going to actually be dealing good damage to Kaido. Maybe it might be him having a conversation with Momo along the way. And so maybe that, like, inspires Luffy. Maybe uh, Yamato, you know, will also say something to Luffy. Luffy arrives and Yamato's still fighting Kaido. And maybe Yamato is defeated. Not killed, but defeated. And then Yamato looks over to Luffy and, like, you need to defeat my father. And Luffy's, like, he's remembering everybody. He's remembering Kinemon and the Scabbards and his crew and, you know, Law's crew and everybody. All the samurai he met at Wano and Yasui. I don't think Luffy really had a relationship with Yasuie. Crap, did Luffy even meet Yasuie? No, I don't think he did. I think he was broadcast in the uh, prison, but I don't think Luffy ever actually met Yasuie. Okay, whatever. Otama. Otama is one. Ace, the spirit of Ace. He might think of Ace and just be like, okay, Ace also wanted to protect this land. And Yamato's right there like, protect this land. And Luffy's like, okay, I will. Let's do this. And then so Luffy fights against Kaido. And it's going to be an epic fight. And then, right when Luffy is about to win, because Luffy will win, right when Luffy is about to win, Kaido will have a moment where he looks over at Luffy, and he's like, You are him. You are. I didn't think you were at first, Straw Hat. But you are truly Joy Boy, Captain Rocks, Whitebeard, Wang Zhi. You follow in their legacy. And it's like right before Kaido's about to launch like the final attack. Like both Luffy and Kaido are beat to shit at this point. And they're about ready to launch a final attack at each other. And, and Kaido has a word like that. Like you are the next Joy Boy. And Luffy's response to that is, I do not give a shit. Luffy's like, I do not care if I am some reincarnation of Joy Boy, I don't care about his will. I don't care about this Wang Zhi. I mean, it's a cool name, but I don't care. I'm Monkey D. Luffy. I'm out, I'm out there on the sea because I want to be, because I want to have a grand adventure, and I will be King of the Pirates, and that means you have to fall. Get the hell off of this giant muffin mountain. Get the hell off of this island. Get out of Wano. And let all these people live in peace. Gear forth, lion, snake, tank man, king, 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 Godzilla, Kong gun. Bam! That's how it's going to go. Roughly speaking, of course. I think that's how it's going to go. But I think it will end with Kaido admitting that Luffy is Joy Boy. And Joy Boy saying something to the effect of, I don't care. And then, bam. So that's that. And uh, with that, we now end out with Usopp. Man, that would have been a good way to end <laughs> the video with Luffy rather than Usopp. But no, we have to save the last for God. The God for last. All right, so here we are with Usopp. All right, number four of the Straw Hats. Um, I just realized four in Japanese is she, which can also stand for death, which is not, it's an unlucky number. And that's Usopp's number. I don't know if that'll come back into anything. Well, Usopp is kind of unlucky. He, he does get his, uh, his skull cracked plenty of times in this series. But anyway, so Usopp's moment, okay? Usopp had one moment there, of course, where he was like pleading with Nami, like it's okay to lie sometimes. And that, of course, ties back to his character. But Usopp so far has not actually had a straight up fight with any of the Toby Ropo because so far he was just fighting with Nami, kind of like running away, sort of hit and run tactics with Ulti and Page One, right? So if, uh, 
you know, Ulti is defeated, uh, maybe we could have a moment now with Usopp. Usopp is going to go, because the Minx and the Beast Pirates, I think, are going to protect Otama. All right, so they don't have to worry about that. You know, the ones that were turned with the Dongo and everything. So they don't have to worry about Otama's safety anymore. So Nami might go off and they might separate, like, okay, I'm going to go over here and Usopp's might run away. Now, he might run into page one again. Uh, page one is the weakest Toby Ropo and he was already punched out with a Conqueror's Hockey Fist by Big Mom. So now it might be a more even kind of fight there. Uh, so Usopp Usopp is really, uh, you know, he hasn't really had a straight one-on-one -on -one fight yet, and so we might still get that, and it's cool. Um, also, just the fact that Nami and Usopp did team up, I thought that was a nice combo there, just because they're kind of like part of the weakling trio and everything, but they had their moment to shine, in, uh, you know, together. But I want to see it, like, individually now, okay? Like, Nami had that moment, that was on her own, but I want to see that with Usopp now. I want to see a return of Soggy King. I want to see a return of Sage King. Uh, Usopp used the Sage King mask against Perona, and it was sort of like this, like, multiple personality thing he had going on. But it would actually be really cool if we get a moment where he remembers the Sage King kind of attitude. And he maybe still has the mask, but he doesn't put on the mask. He just, like, wait a second, I don't need this mask anymore. I am Sage King. I've trained myself to be, that was what I did the last two years, I trained myself to become a brave warrior of the sea, and so maybe he still has the Sage King mask, and he's about, about to put it on, but then he tosses it away, or he breaks it, or whatever. He's like, I don't need this anymore, because I am the Sage King! And he takes out his ultimate attack, and he launches it, and maybe he uses, a, like, a smoke grenade, blinds page one, he's like a Spinosaur, like, oh, I can't see! And then he's, like, firing, like, sticky adhesive on the ground, so page one gets stuck, he's like, oh, I can't! move and like he like fires the paste into his mouth he's like rrr, rrr, rrr. he can't attack he can't bite anything and then that's when he busts out like his strongest uh, pop green uh what is Usopp's strongest pop green because i like to think there's a seed that he keeps maybe in a little container like in a sealed chest or container that he doesn't take out because it's so dangerous like if i take this out if i release it if this comes in contact with air or blood it's like a blood vine or something it comes in contact it grows out of control and i can't stop it okay and he only, he can't use it when his friends are around because it's like, maybe it's like some kind of blood-sucking vampire vine. Like something Karama would use from Yu Yu Hakusho. Actually, I think that was something Karama used in Yu Yu Hakusho. But like, it's like a, a blood thorny uh, briar or whatever. So he launches it and it hits something and it just grows out of control and it like finds people to like latch onto and like suck out their blood and that's why Usopp doesn't use it very often or at all. If he can't use it if like Nami or Otama or anybody was around. But if he fights against an enemy, but if he... If, but if he fights against an enemy, like let's say page one, one on one, in like maybe an isolated area or it's outside Onigashima, he fires it and then it just drains him, you know, dry, and then that's how Usopp wins. Moment like that, that would be really cool. All right. Well, anyway, um, that took a lot longer than I thought it would. I've been sitting here about an hour now, uh, but we're not quite done yet because we have to do. That's right. It's been a while. We took a little break, but we got to do Ant Facts. <laughs> Yeah, and I, you know, just when you think, because I have a list of, like, really unique ant species in the world, and I'm going down that list, and I'm like, trap jaw ants, already talked about those, army ants, already talked about those twice, bulldog ants, talked about those, the ants that blow themselves up, talked about those. Today's episode is going to be all about the honey ant, or the honey pot ant, okay? I've actually seen some of these before, not in person, but like pictures, okay? Ants with very swollen abdomens. And I was like, what is the deal with those, you know? So this is actually very interesting. This is a weird way that ants have evolved a specific species uh, or genus to store food, okay? So with the honey ants, they have the regular workers, the workers that go out there and forage and bring food back to the colony, pretty standard, you know, behavior for ants. But this species has a very select caste system of workers where some of the workers go out and forage other workers stay in the hive or in the colony at all times and their primary job is to engorge themselves on as much food as possible liquid honey sap you know whatever you know whatever ants eat they consume all of it to the point where their abdomens swell to the size of like you know i don't know like maybe they are the size of like little ping pong balls they look pretty big i don't know quite that big but they get pretty big and so what they do is they engorge themselves and they live at the bottom of the colony as far down as they can get and they are essentially the food stores 
for the castle, for the colony. They're basically the larders or the refrigerators. So if there's ever a situation, and a lot of these ant species live in like deserts or climates where there can be a drought and a lack of food or a lack of water, if there's ever a lack of food, then the ants, the regular workers, go down there where these other ants are, and they uh, basically uh, touch their antennae, and that may basically sends a signal for them to throw up, this is disgusting, but you know, sends a signal for them to throw up some sap or honey or liquid that the workers can consume for food. And this is actually a more common behavior than you might think. It's called trophallaxis, which sounds like some kind of like laxative or something. Try trophallaxis when you just can't make it, you know? But trophallaxis, all right, is a, a, a behavior, not just insects, but birds do it too, where they're like basically throw up in each other's mouths. You know how like mama birds will like puke into the mouth of their babies in order to, you know, give them sustenance and stuff? Basically that. Like this picture here, it looks like two ants making out, but no, they're like doing trophallaxis. They're like, you know, exchanging food. That's basically the process. It is kind of disgusting, but that is what it is, okay? So, that's cool. So you basically have ants whose whole job is just to stay in one room and eat as much food as possible to the point where they're swollen and then just throw up in workers' mouths when there's like a drought or something. So they're basically the food stores, the larders, and the refrigerators and freezers of the insect world. That was a pretty interesting ant fact, I must say. All right, well, anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. This has been a long video. I got to pick up all these dice. Uh, but yeah, have a good one. This will be Checking and Barry signing out.